<laughs> so, uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming to the Union this e um, today. It's my pleasure to welcome uh, Catherine Gunn, Martin Bright, and Gavin Hood. Uh, Catherine is a former Mandarin translator for GCHQ. In 2003, she leaked a memo outlining a joint US-UK intelligence operation uh, to spy on Security Council delegates in order to rig the votes for the Iraq war. Um, she was charged with the breach of the Official Secrets Act, which was later dropped uh, with no reason by the government. Uh, Martin um, is a former political editor of the New Statesman and the Jewish Chronicle. In 2003, he was Home Affairs Editor of The Observer and broke the story on this intelligence operation. He now runs Creative Society, a charity that helps young people in media and the arts. Uh, Gavin Hood is uh, a director. He has directed Rendition, a film about uh, infamous CIA black sites where suspected terrorists are interrogated and uh, tortured. He's also directed Eye in the Sky, which explored moral, the moral and ethical questions uh, related to drone use. For this work, he was awarded the Sydney Lumet's Award for Integrity and Entertainment at the Human Rights First Dinner in New York. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Catherine Gunn, Martin Bright, and Gavin Hood. Thank you. Um, so the way this is going to work is we're now going to be showing a trailer and a short clip of the film, after which Gavin will make some remarks. Um, I'll ask some questions, and then we'll open the floor to you guys. What we know is that Saddam has this material. We don't know that. I mean, he just keeps repeating the lie. Just because you're the prime minister, it doesn't mean you get to make up your own facts. Someone in this building has betrayed their country. If you are found to have withheld information, you will be charged with a breach of the Official Secrets Act. Catherine Gunn, who do you think might have leaked the Cosa email? I've got something you need to see. Who brought you this? Friend? Be careful. If this is real, you could go to jail just for having it in your possession. You're a spy. You work for the British government. No, I work for the British people. I do not collect information so that the government can lie to the British people. Intelligence may be being manipulated to take this country to war. This paper needs to stop taking Tony Blair at face value. You had nothing to gain and everything to lose. This could result in a prison sentence. Do you want to risk it all? This war is historically unpopular. It's everywhere. Every country. Biggest demonstration in human history. If we do not go public, we would be conceding that no one can ever tell the people when their government is lying. And what you did, it was extraordinary. The war is illegal. The public is entitled to know why. My motive was to stop a war and save lives. I have to tell the truth. I suppose the difficult question for everybody here is, and I'm so sorry if this is the case, but I doubt anyone has seen the film. But it, well, there was a screening at the festival last night, so maybe <laughs> one person was in London for the festival. So just so we know what we're talking about, because I, I don't want to address things that you go, what is he talking about? So anybody has seen the film? Excellent. One person. Excellent. You see it in London last night? Oh, you saw it in New York. Ah, listen to the accent. Good. Anyway, thank you. So can you can, any good? If, you, if you take a minute to fill everyone else in, that would just <laughs> solve the problem. Um, so it is a strange thing, as you can imagine, to talk about a film that, that you haven't seen, but we're very thankful that you've allowed us to come, because I'm only here this week, and, and the film opens a quick plug next weekend on the 18th. But and, hope... and it's showing at the Cambridge Film Festival. And when is that? Next week. Ah, it's showing at the Cambridge Film Festival. Yeah. So if you don't understand anything we say, go along and see the film and it maybe makes sense. Um, so what I will say, perhaps, for this conversation is, maybe we don't talk so much about the film itself, as about the themes and ideas that the film raises might be, might be interesting. But just to give you a basic idea of what the story is about, Catherine Gunn, sitting right next to me, this wonderful young lady, who's played by Kira Knightley in the film, in 2003, in the run-up to the Iraq War, was working at GCHQ, 
you know what I think I should do? I should ask Catherine to tell this part of the story. <laughs> Catherine, tell us what you were doing in 2003, and then I'll pick up and finish some bits. Go on. It's much better. Come. Why am I talking if she's here? Okay. <laughs> so, yes, I was working at GCHQ in 2003, and uh, I was a Mandarin linguist and translator. Um, the Iraq war had been mooted by this stage. It had been talked about. It, had, it was in the press. It was in the media. And I was very concerned. I was very concerned about um, what was going to happen because I'd, you know, I, I'd heard about the first Gulf War. I was about 16 at the time when the first Gulf War happened. I'd heard about the 10 years or more of sanctions that had been imposed <coughs> on Iraq. And, and, and so I was thinking, why on earth are we talking about Iraq again, you know, for a third time? And so I started to do some research and, and, and reading on my own, and it, I swiftly came to the conclusion that there was, it appeared, no justification for a war in Iraq. And then on the 31st of March, I saw an email which was sent out from NSA to GCHQ. 31st of January. 31st of January. January. What oh, did I say? March. Oh, I'm... That's okay. Sorry. I just want to make sure I did my research. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> the film's made now. I can't change it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 31st of January of uh, 2003, yeah. and um, basically it was a memo requesting GCHQ to assist NSA in the spying of UN Security Council delegates. So these were Angola, Bulgaria, Cameroon, Chile, Guinea, and Pakistan. Correct. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, Mexico. Uh, well, Mexico okay. and Mexico. Mexico was a... Well, Mexico were collected. Yeah. I mean, essentially they, they could spy on anyone. Yeah. Possibly. I don't know, Catherine, could they? Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, the thing was they wanted to gather information on these um, delegates from these six swing nations and use that information to coerce them into voting for a resolution for war. And I thought that was absolutely appalling, immoral, illegal behavior. And, and so I leaked it. <laughs> yeah, so Catherine, what's interesting to me about Catherine's story is it, you know, on the one hand it seems like a story about spies and security services, but I think what drew me to the story was two things. One, yes, it was about spies and it was about how did we get into this Iraq war and, and so on, but what really drew me to it was what would I do, what would you do, what would you do if you were at work, whatever that place of work is, one day when you got into the world, and... Um, and something comes into your email inbox from your boss that asks you to do something or makes you aware of something that is unethical within the company you're working for or illegal or immoral and you discover something's rotten at the core of wherever you're working. Whether, now we know lots of real world examples, you know, Cambridge Analytica comes to mind, um, Enron comes to mind, you know, Wall Street firms. Um, what will you do? What would I do if we saw something that we felt was clearly wrong, and we felt that we should speak up about it. And the question is, would you risk your job to speak up? And in Catherine's case, of course, she risked not only losing her job, but her freedom too. So what I was drawn to in this film was the idea that I was telling a very personal story about an individual person who's not unlike, as you see her, any of us. She happened to have a very interesting and strange job, but it's a job. Um, and she faced a personal, moral decision. Um, so that's the simple way into the movie. It happens to also ask all sorts of interesting questions about a war that we now know we were all lied into. Post the Chilcot report in, in 2010, we know that Bush and Blair had a strong agenda for regime change. And that need that they had in their minds to change that regime was so strong that they didn't really mind what they had to do to get that result. And in f a lot of people say, well, Catherine leaked the memo, and there was outrage, but the war happened anyway. Well, let's pause for a moment. The war happened, and as most of you may know, and I know we're the old guys, so maybe you guys were younger at the time, but the war happened anyway, um, but they were compelled to rely for their reason, their legal justification for going to war, on the idea that Saddam Hussein was an presents an imminent threat to this country based on the fact that they said he had, well not the fact, but based on the fact that they said he had weapons of mass destruction, which at one point they said could be launched against Britain within 45 minutes, chemical attack, we're in danger. 
And why was that so important? And I'm, I'm just going to offer two quick things to think about. How many law students are here? Okay, so the lawyers know, or hopefully know, that there are two legal justifications for going to war with another country. One is we're under danger of being imminently attacked. The Im attack must be imminent to justify the, the argument of self-defense. Right? And the second way, which is a much nicer, cleaner way, would have been a cleaner way for Tony Blair, is we have a United Nations resolution for war. We, who are all signatories to the UN Charter, have agreed that if we see an incident going on in a particular country that amounts to a genocide or something terrible, we can all get together, take a vote on the UN Security Council, and authorize war so that no country that participates in, war, that, in that war will be charged with a war crime. None of their soldiers will, none of their, 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 their leaders will. Um, so it would have been great if Tony Blair could have got a UN resolution for war. Admiral Boyce, the head of the British Armed Forces, was demanding a legal justification for war and refusing to enter Iraq without a letter from the Attorney General explaining that the war would be legal. Um, and so when Catherine leaked this memo, one thing that did happen was she put a giant wrench into any notion that they were going to get that resolution. Because bear in mind, of the five permanent members on the Security Council, only Britain and, and the United States were in favor of that war. France, uh, Russia, and China were against it. So they needed the votes of these smaller countries. They needed the votes of the non-permanent members on the Security Council in order to at least get a moral authority for the war and then hope that the other three major powers didn't use their veto mm -hmm. to scuttle it which they could have done, but they may have abstained. And they may then have had the big coalition of the willing that was George Bush's dream, a lot more countries invading Iraq, and the issue of weapons of mass destruction <coughs> would have been sort of further down the list. So although the war happened, Catherine, Catherine's leak made those smaller countries so angry that they refused to even bring it to a vote. And so Britain and the United States were forced to rely on the weapons of mass destruction mm -hmm. argument. Which they found none. And then, of course, they found that there were no weapons of mass destruction. And in my view, Bush and Blair should be brought to trial. They won't be for reasons that are complicated in the legal system, um, but uh, including the fact that we not, weren't signatories at the time to the International Criminal Court. But um, at least history has a clearer vision of what actually happened. Do you mind if I say a couple of words yes, at this point? Mm. Um, history. Yes, history. How many people here are historians? Wonderful. Excellent. Oh, okay. Politics students? And other people here born around 2000, 2001, is that right? Wow. Oh, yeah. Okay, so well. let's not forget, right? Yeah. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about history. Very good, sir. Yeah. And <laughs> so we're talking about the equivalent of when I was at university of the Vietnam, Vietnam War, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, so why does this matter? This mm. is. 16 years ago. Mm -hmm. Is this just a historical document? Um, now, interestingly, we've, Catherine and I have just come back from uh, Hamburg, and in Hamburg, a question was asked about, well, what does it matter? 16 years ago? It's, yeah, you didn't stop the war. Um, and there was a question asked from the chair, but of course, people in the audience in Germany I mean, he said, well, of course, my history matters profoundly. History in Germany is everything. Um, the idea of truth, the idea of establishing what really happened, the idea of guilt, the idea of retribution, the idea of reconciliation. These are really important issues in, in Germany, and it made me realize that this film is likely to be seen in very different ways in, in different contexts. Hmm. Um, so I don't really want to make a statement here. I just want to, no, maybe this evening, to ask the question about why history matters. Why establishing what really happened in 2003, because this story risked being just a footnote to history. It risked being completely forgotten. It was not included in, I mean, Catherine was not invited to give evidence to any of the major inquiries. This blows my mind. She wasn't, so, she wasn't invited to Chilcot. Wasn't invited. Yeah. And so, to my mind, what's, what's important about this film, but I mean, I'd like to hear what other people think, is, is that finally we do have the history of this period, or the history of um, 
or this story's part in history is finally being established. It will still be challenged, of course, but that, for me, is, is one of the reasons this film is so important. Hmm. Well, um, I just want to ask you a question kind of, um, from your experience as a whistleblower. Um, so later in this term, we're actually having Edward Snowden speak by video link from Moscow. Ah, oh, well, you'll be packed for that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I want say it's quite relevant um, politically. In the States, um, you know, an unnamed whistle whistleblower is uh, set to give information to the Congress about Trump's dealings uh, with the Ukrainian premier. So my question is, um, given your experience, what advice would you give to um, you know, this with particular whistleblower in the States and to future with, um, people that you know, are maybe making up their minds about being a whistleblower, about things they find wrong? That is a good question, and it's one I'm asked quite a lot, but I'll endeavor to give a reasonable answer. Um, I think, you know, well, Dan Ellsberg has made pronouncements on what he thinks this current whistleblower should do. Um, which is which is just to come public. <laughs> um, if there's anything that they really believe is, is so uh, relevant, despite the sort of threats from um, Bush, I'm uh, sorry, Trump, I'm really sleepy today. <laughs> um, despite his uh, ludicrous, ludicrous, you know, claims of wanting to bury whoever this person is, they should come forward because the stakes are so high. Um, However, that's not always possible um, for personal security reasons. I should imagine that in this current scenario in, in, um, in the US, there's sufficient support for this whistleblower in the opposition parties mm. that they would, uh, they would have a great deal of protection. Um, I think the danger is when people come out and they, for example, like Ed Snowden, um, have no support across the board, um, and that is that is the true of all you know previous whistleblowers in 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 the United States. Becoming a whistleblower is not something you set out to do. It's not it's not a goal in life, right? It's something <laughs> it's something that is, sort of happens out of nowhere, and um, sometimes it. It has a time limit. For example, my, my case, there was definitely a time limit. I, I felt like I had to get it out quickly so I didn't bring it up to, um, to my superior's attention. And Martin thinks I definitely should have gone direct to the press, which, looking back, I think perhaps there's a valid, definitely very valid points for doing that. Um, but, you know, some people did do that. For example, Ed Snowden um, and uh, to an extent, Chelsea Manning did that, and it hasn't turned out well for either. Mm. So, I, I think it's a very, very individual decision. But my advice would be to to really think about why you want to do this. You, you've absolutely got to know what your intentions are, what you try to um, what you're trying to achieve, if you're trying to achieve anything at all. To um, approach somebody who you feel you can trust, whether it's a lawyer or someone in, uh, in media, and, and to devise a sort of plan on going forward. I think those are sort of very basic things that you need to figure out first um, before you actually take this leap into the unknown, because once you've done it, there's no going back. Um, Mark, so you mentioned, uh, Catherine just mentioned uh, Daniel Ellsberg, mm -hmm. and of course you were speaking about how um, the Iraq war to us, you know, chronologically, is the equivalent of the Vietnam War to you. Yes. Now, um, I did watch the film, and I won't give too much away, but there is a quite a powerful um, scene, if subtle, um, where you, as played by Matt Smith, um, says what he's going to write when uh, Catherine was exposed as the whistleblower. Um, and he has a quote, again, from Daniel Ellsberg, which, as, uh, you know, as a historian, is quite powerful because it reminds you that you know, these, uh, this deceit, um, you know, lying to get a country into war, um, goes on quite frequently, you know, it seems every few decades. Um, yet, you know, the, and the truth, has, you know, in both cases did come out um, slower in the first case and more quickly, luckily, in the next. Um, so my question to you is, um, is truth enough to act, you know, to have a material effect? Because, you know, we've, again, we've had two of these cases. The truth has come out about both of them. Is it, has enough changed? Is there more that we you know, need to do? It's something that I've often uh, wondered and obviously you torture yourself to a certain extent 
about these stories on whether you've, <clears throat> whether you've done enough, whether you've acted quickly enough, whether you've worked hard enough. Well, Dan so, Ellsberg, if I can yeah. just interject, yeah. he certainly feels that he definitely should have come forward much, much, much more quickly. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but, it's, but the job of a journalist, uh, the job of a journalist is not to stop a war. The jo job of a journalist um, is, is simply to, I mean, I'm, I'm not being kind of falsely humble here, I think it's, it's correct that the, the job of a journalist is, is relatively simple. It's about, um, it's about corralling information, uh, checking it to the best of your ability, uh, making sure that the facts are correct and reporting that to the public. And we, we I mean, uh, in the film you will have noticed that a number of times people turn to me and say, stop overthinking this. Uh, at one point, uh, uh, and someone in the intelligence services or someone who works with the intelligence services says, and because I'm torturing myself, or I'm, I, it's very odd to talk in this way, but uh, I, Matt Smith, as me, says, <laughs> uh, you know, what could this be? What could this document be? Because I didn't meet Catherine. I just had this series of words on a piece of paper. And I'm thinking, could it be a, could it be a sophisticated forgery? Could it, could it be something cooked up by the anti-war movement? Could it... Could it just have fallen from the sky? What is this thing? It's just a series of words typed on a piece of paper. Um, and, uh, and this former rear admiral in the, in the Navy says, what do you really think? I think you're overthinking it. And maybe sometimes things are just what they seem. So my belief is that sometimes journalists do overthink things. Sometimes journalists act ideologically when they shouldn't do. And if you stick to your job, just as Catherine stuck to her job, and reveal information as you see it, sometimes that should be enough. Okay, I think we're going to open the floor to questions now. So, Great. Um, if anybody has questions, please raise your hands. Um, over there. So Mike coming. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, um, Catherine Gunn, my understanding was once your trial ended, you largely receded from the public eye and left um, a fairly private life. So how did you feel when you were approached about this movie being made? Like, where were you in that point of your life? Um, well, the story uh, and the wish to, to tell the story actually started about eight, ten years ago. Um, so... Um, in truth, a former, well, a friend of mine who I grew up with, who's who was always, you know, involved in the arts and drama, he wanted to write a script about it, and he did. And it was very factual. I mean, it was as accurate as you could be. It may have been a little bit dry. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, and we touted it around BBC, Channel 4, HBO, um, in around about 2000 and. Five or six, I think. Wow! So very Ooh. soon after. Yeah, fairly relatively soon. Relatively before too the show soon. got in quite too soon. Were, that was people probably were sick of it. Sick of the Iraq war. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and mm. they didn't. Nobody. It, nobody was biting. Nobody was interested. Um, so that that sort of went by the wayside, and then a, a lovely lady, um, a lovely American lady, decided she wanted to write a book about my case, and she pursued me and put persuaded me after many lengthy emails and phone calls. Uh, and so she did write a book called The Spy Who Tried to Stop a War. And from that, a, a script was developed. <coughs> that script, um, well, the script writers never came and talked to either myself or Martin. Um, they felt it, it wasn't necessary to do so. They didn't want to do so. So they um, wrote a script which... They used the book. They right? used the yeah. book, but, but they elaborated and they, and they tried to create a story that was very much more in a Hollywood kind of um, mode. <laughs> and, and, and there were ups and downs with the script in terms of people wanting to, um, to make it. Ultimately, it fell through for possibly the third time. Uh, and then... Uh, Jed Doherty, your, your producer, mm. you 
worked with previously on Eye in the Sky, contacted uh, Gavin and said, have you ever heard of Catherine Mann? Yeah. And so that kind of brings us back to the beginning again. <laughs> yes, yes, I said um, that. Yeah. But that, that's how the, the um, approach came about. And by, the, by that stage, Martin and I had become quite um, sort of skeptical. Um, and we were a little bit suspicious of these people who, who claimed that they were going to put this story on the screen. Um, but we were really impressed because right from the start, um, Gavin said, I want to hear the story from your point of view. Uh, and so we met in London and um, he came and, and sat down at my at the dining table in this Airbnb kitchen that we were renting and said, look, just start from the beginning and I'm going to write it down in my great big leather notebook, <laughs> which he did for five days and then he moved on to Martin and then it moved on from Martin to the various other journalists yep. and eventually Ben Emerson, who is the lawyer who helped to defend me. Um, and so we've worked collabor collaboratively ever since and it's, you know, it's, uh, I'm very grateful that we had this opportunity to tell, to tell the story in a truthful and faithful way. Me too. It, 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 thanks, Kat. And yeah, the, I think that's what was great for me because I'd never written a story about people who are still very much alive. And I think that, you know, with respect to the previous writers, they, 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 it, I understand how easily they got derailed because at one point we were, we had approached a certain studio that shall be nameless to make the movie and I'll tell you a funny story. So I'm trying to, it, it's, it's tricky, right? You're trying to tell a story in two hours that took place over a year and you need every material fact and every significant event to be accurate, but at the same time you're trying to compress time. So um, I'm going back and forth all the time with Martin and Catherine. I couldn't have done this without them. I mean, they really, really, really helped me a lot. And Martin introduced me to Edward E. Army and Peter Beaumont and Ben Emerson and everybody. But at one point I'm with the studio, right? And we think, we're getting close with this. I mean, I think I'm feeling excited about the script and this executive goes, yeah, 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 we need Guys, we need more running down alleys. We need, and, 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 and by the way, when does she don her cape? That's literally a quote. You can imagine. It's all, I live in LA and I'm an American citizen now, so my kids are born there. So, so I'm used to being around this kind of hype in, in, in this movie. When does she don her cape? Well, we didn't make the movie with those guys. And, um, Luckily, we found a wonderful studio, E1, and their representatives are here tonight, and thank you so much to them, who let us tell the story in a truthful way. And, um, but it is a tricky thing, because in a conventional narrative, you know, you have a hero, something goes wrong in their world, they face off against this antagonist who should be equal and opposite to the hero. Who, those, who, who are the English students here? Any English <laughs> students? Any writing students? Okay, so Joseph Campbell, Hero with a Thousand Faces, The Dawn of Star Wars, and the death of conventional, I mean, unconventional narrative. Um, so the hero meets the antagonist, he meets various tricksters along the way. By Act 3, he has a huge clash with the forces of, uh, in, uh, in opposition to him. He succeeds, and the world is set right until the next um, sequel, <laughs> and then we do the story all over again. This story just doesn't fit into that. This story, and it's so hard, I'm so sorry if we're talking to you about something you haven't seen, but this story, my way in eventually was, okay, it's never going to fit this conventional narrative. So what's the truth? Is there enough drama in the truth? And it turns out there is, okay? A memo lands on a young woman's desk. It's not right. It's asking her to do something that makes her very uncomfortable. There's plenty of drama in that. It's really tricky to decide what to do with this dangerous material. Well, unconventionally for a normal narrative in Hollywood, she then passes the baton to a journalist, well, wait, wait a minute, what happened to my lead? She just handed over to someone else. Well, that's what happened, it's okay. She passes this memo, it lands on Martin's desk. He's then faced with a moral dilemma. Should I waste what's going to be clearly amount of tremendous amount of energy trying to verify whether this thing is true or not, because she's torn off the header, so I don't know where it came from. It doesn't say who sent it, all, because she doesn't want to get anyone in trouble, so she just pans out the content of this email with a vague note in ballpoint pen on the back that says, from Frank Coza, NSA. And this poor guy gets this, and he goes, what is this? Right? Well, thank God he did his job, which is to really dig in and research it, because it was handed to a previous paper, the Mirror, who did nothing with it for two weeks and thought, ah, it's probably too much work. So he does his job as a journalist, but then, of course, difficult for... Piers for Morgan a, was the editor at the time, but... <laughs> Piers Morgan. Yeah. Um, now the memo lands on the desk of a lawyer, effectively, yeah. and Catherine's character comes back into the narrative, 
And will that lawyer waste his time and energy figuring out a defense to what seems very difficult, the Official Secrets Act for the lawyers and the po politics students, uh, is, is pretty tough and doesn't really have yeah, any no defense. defense. There's no yeah. defense, and so he's trying to figure out this, this defense. So I thought, okay, well, we, there is a structure here. Memo lands here in story one, memo goes to a second story, memo goes to a third story, and Catherine's character is the through line through it. And these guys really helped me just stick to that narrative structure, and, and, and that's where the story came from. And then finally we managed to find someone willing to give us the money to actually make it. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Right, uh, there. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, as you just mentioned, you did have a few studios trying to change the narrative of the, the, the original story. Did you take any artistic um, license? Uh, yes, just for the sake of keeping the story together, yeah. not necessarily changing the story, but just changing the importance of certain facts in the story? I think it's a brilliant question, and any narrative. I mean, here's the, what is, how, how do any of us tell a story? I'm telling you stories now. I'm telling you a story about a studio. I'm placing emphasis in certain places. I'm, you know what I mean? This, because the real story, I'd have to follow it around with a camera. In fact, I'd have to follow around with a 360-degree camera <laughs> because I'm looking at you. So we're, we're sharing a story right now. Is our story the same? I'm seeing you, but you're seeing me. We're all looking at, you're sitting over there. We're all looking at the same event from slightly different perspectives and slightly different histories and so on. So here's the thing. What are the big signposts in this journey that we are not going to take license with? The content of the memo. What did it say? Where did it land? Who did, whose desk it landed on her desk? Where did that memo go? It was leaked to, now here's where I did take license. To this day, to her credit, Catherine handed that memo to a friend who had worked at GCHQ, that much she told me, mm. asked, and I said, be careful what I say, but she has never revealed the name of that person. So I've got a little blank there as a writer, and I go, well, I'll just invent a person that worked at GCHQ that you handed to, and then I'll run it by you. And if there's anything in what I do that's like blatantly wrong, tell me. But she, quite rightly, to protect her friend, does not want to reveal that person's name to this day. I understand that. Is that a material fact? No, it's an intermediary. The memo was handed to a friend. In the movie, that friend is fictionalized. The lady on the farm, who, who, for those of you who've seen the movie, the lady on the farm that she talks to. Um, may or may not have been a woman, may, may, but there is a person. And that person then handed it to a journalist called Yvonne Ridley. That is a fact. Yvonne and Catherine are protecting the intermediary. I think that's okay. Yvonne Ridley um, took it to Martin Bright. Martin Bright spoke to Peter Beaumont, his editors. They had various meetings that Martin just talked to me in their editorial team, four or five or six or whatever they were, Martin, before you finally decided to publish. Well, I'm making a movie in two hours. I take all the information I get from Martin about what happened in those meetings and from Peter Beaumont who was in those meetings, and I finally say, guys, can I compress this information into the highlights and make it happen in one meeting? So in the movie, there is a scene where they debate whether to publish the memo or not, and all the arguments they had in five or six meetings are compressed into one meeting. I hope that's okay. These guys said, yeah, 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 that's fine. These are the key points, that's great. So I think that's how you go about it, you know. Is, it, it, lawyers use the word material fact. A, a material fact is something without which the case collapses, right? If it's material that you are wearing um, uh, shoes with the white soles, this young lady in the front here, it, does it matter what her shoes look like? Well, if the witness says the murderer was wearing, you know, shoes with white soles on ice, then this, it's, it's material. But if, you know, it, she just happened to be wearing shoes and you can't remember what the shoes were, but it doesn't matter to the case. And that's the kind of approach, I think. What are the material facts? And don't deviate from those. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? No. One question? <laughs> They're all uh, going up now. <laughs> Hi, I was wondering if you could discuss what the reaction was in the various countries targeted, like Angola and Mexico, to the leak of the memo. Mm. It's it's very good that, but yeah, yeah, Martin. <laughs> sure. Yeah, it's 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 a that's a very interesting question, and it's one of the elements of the film that's still um, a journalistic loose end. There are a number of journalistic loose ends in in the film. There are 
and historical loose ends, things that um, we still don't know. Uh, what we do know is that uh, one country issued a statement saying, and this country was Bulgaria, that said, we are very glad to have been spied on by the United States. <laughs> we feel hugely flattered. In fact, we would have been insulted not to have been spied on by the United States. <laughs> So that was not uh, particularly helpful and, uh, <laughs> to our story uh, or That's to the terrible, world. Though. I'm sorry about that. It's like being proud of being bullied by the mean girls. <laughs> yeah. um, or it's deeply sarcastic. Uh, yeah, <laughs> wish, yeah, potentially. Wish, yeah. <laughs> because one of the things that happens with a story like this is one way, one way of diffusing a story like this is saying, oh, we, all, we know that kind of happens. Ultra cynicism, right? Yeah. We all know that this kind of thing goes on. Um, Actually, it doesn't. But in fact, we don't know that. But that's no. really important what Catherine's really important. just said. Please it elaborate. Doesn't. Well, it doesn't go on yeah. because there are only a few countries that can afford to do this sort of thing and have the technology that can do yeah. this sort of thing. So yeah. clearly it's not everybody does it. Yeah. Some of the key players do, and I think we know who those are. Right. But then a key nation was Chile. Chile were outraged by what happened. There had been a history of American dirty tricks in Chile, in the overthrow of a government in Chile and the establishment of a right-wing dictatorship. So when UN, uh, US Dirty Tricks appeared on the front page of The Observer and Chile's name was among the nations being spied on, that had a particular historical resonance for that country. And I can remember sitting in front of the Chilean ambassador in, in London and he had tears in his eyes because he, he said to me that I thought we've restored relations with America. We thought they'd stop doing this kind of thing. Uh, you know, I, you know, all they needed to do is pick up the phone. I would have told them what our negotiation was. Well, he actually was. said, I, I yeah. got your notes. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I remember Martin's notes because we wrote the scene, and I'm, it's the one thing I regret, it didn't make yeah. the movie in the editorial post because it, for narrative reasons, that particular thing felt like we were going off on another tangent when my audience was trying to find out what happened to Catherine. But I really have one regret, and I think mm. you do too, that that scene. So I had all Martin's notes, what he asked and what the ambassador said. And I remember sa him saying, uh, we send a fax yes, every, every day, day to the UN and the, and, the, and the British Embassy stating our position on where we are at mm. in regards to this r war with Iraq. Why do they need to spy on us? It yeah. feels like, this was in your notes, Pinochet all over again. Yeah. And that was one of the countries that refused to bring yes. this um, request for a vote yeah. to the Security Council. Said, We're not voting. Chile was like, that's that. And so, very quickly, um, Bush and Blair, we, we don't need a vote. Yeah. We just go to war anyway. Three days later, was it, Martin? Uh, um, well, Colin Powell's speech was three days later. Colin Powell's speech mm -hmm. later emphasizes all of this terrible weapons of mass destruction yeah. thing, mobile labs, all of which turns out to be absolute rubbish, made up by an Iraqi defector in the hands of the German um, um, uh, looking, who was looking for a way out of Iraq because he was afraid of things he'd said about Saddam, this chemical engineer codenamed Curveball, you can look him up. So Curveball tosses out this absolute bullshit information and the United States, because they are desperate to go into this war, grabs it and uses it as fact. I mean, the fact that this most powerful nation on the earth was deceived into a war because of their own desire for a certain outcome by a lying piece of chemical engineering BS from Iraq. <laughs> I mean, really, it's astonishing. Yeah. For those who know about Curveball, that's the next movie. Um, <laughs> but anyway, sorry, Martin, I digress. No, but, I, yeah. I, Angry Chilean. I just remember I, reading your notes, yeah. so I feel a sense yeah, exactly. of your own outrage. Yeah, Thank and, you, um, you know, yeah, he's a passionate guy. I don't mean to be too <laughs> um, But the other, I mean, the other countries are significant. Um, Guinea and Angola were under immense pressure from America already. And Condoleezza Rice, the Secretary of State, had been... Was she Secretary of State? Yes, she was, mm. wasn't she? Um, mm. Had been doing the tour of uh, African countries, threatening them and saying that you will, there will be dire economic consequences if you do not back this. Well, they also dispatched certain um, people to suggest aid being either That's given right. or withdrawn That's right. in, if you would vote. And there was all this kind of, they, were, they were tackling the problem from many all angles. Sides. Economic, uh, spying. Mm. But yeah. Pakistan is the key, right? We still do not know 
what Pakistan did. And Pakistan's been absolutely crucial to America in the, the war against terror. And, you know, if any of you are thinking of going into journalism, it's still a story to be found out there, right? I mean, what did Pakistan do and what, what, you know, what were the consequences of, of what they did? Mm. 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 And we have time for a couple more questions. And this lady over here has had her arm yeah. up several okay. times. Let's <laughs> <so. laughs> this gentleman over here too. He's been... for Martin and also for Catherine. These events very much took place during a time where we had quite a traditional media landscape. To what extent do you think this would have played out differently if it occurred in 2019 when we do have the prevalence of social media? Hmm. Yeah, we've, we've thought a lot about this because um, these were different times. It, it was in fact, it was the beginning of the new era. Um, and for, I mean, I hope people will go and see the film, but there is a crucial moment where um, we're attacked by an online publication called The Drudge Report, which has, is still a hugely significant right-wing institution in the United States. But it was the early days of internet journalism, and The Drudge Report had been responsible for, um, uh, I suppose, sparking the investigation into, into Clinton. And it was a very powerful new force uh, and for circumstances that should probably remain secret until you see the film. Um, <laughs> it's a very funny scene. They attacked us. If it wasn't us. so tragic, you know the scene. They attacked us. And they accused us of what would now be called fake news. And actually it was, watching, watching the film back, you realise you had the first signs of what was going to come, which was this um, absolute... Uh, almost surreal world where anybody trying to reveal the truth would immediately be attacked for fake news. So we were uh, early victims of that process, I guess. What I feel is that we were working in a different world. The institutions we were working for were, at the time, the, the journalistic institutions felt more robust they were sorely tested by the Iraq war, but we felt we were working in a position of relative security, our jobs were relatively secure, uh, and the newspaper I was working for felt like, um, felt like a pretty robust institution. And at the same time, there was a, almost a compact between us and, and the political class that they at least saw themselves as men and women of honor, that they, uh, at least gave the appearance that it mattered if people thought they were telling the truth. And if we caught them out, and that's the whole point of this story to a certain extent, uh, was if we caught them out, that mattered too. Uh, that, that shame mattered. And that they would put their hands up and admit it. We're, we're living in a world now where politicians don't do that. Uh, indeed, if you challenge them with the truth, they will counter with untruth as a matter of policy. So I do feel for my colleagues today because I think that the landscape has changed beyond belief. And when you're in a situation where um, a single tweet can go around the world, uh, I, I do worry for my colleagues trying to break this kind of story now. Okay, Catherine, do you want to answer that? Or <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we should probably take some I more think we should yeah. probably take some yeah. more questions. Yeah. Yeah. This gentleman's been trying to. Yeah. <laughs> can we maybe take a group of questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah let's ahead. take a few. Sure. A group um, of questions and then we can answer. Yeah, we'll do that. Um, yeah. So, could other people interested in asking questions raise your hands? So, over here as well. Uh, so, what we'll do is um, just I'll kind of ask them. Ask them, so what do you want? Ask them all and like then you'll ask them. Like like two or three, three, two and then we'll, and then we'll, see how we, we can then kind of pick and choose, yeah? Sure. You can pick and choose. Go first. No. Do you think that would have made you less likely to, 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 to 
elitist? Was it all about truth and not lying to the public? Or was there, did your personal views play into it? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you. Next question then. You can answer both those questions. Should we? Why don't you? Should we? No, yeah. One more? Okay. Oh, yeah, so, um, go, go on. Go on. I'll shut up. <laughs> uh, over there. There we go. Uh, I don't know much coming out of my question, but I'm kind of um, I suppose it's a whistler and as a journalist with such a big story, does it feel kind of hard to know that you're coming forth with something and writing something that therefore you're choosing to define your career in that way? And kind of as a journalist talking about the future things. Do you feel it's odd being in a career where you know you probably only have, you know, one or two of these defining stories and kind of feel that that's in your hands? <laughs> Shall I take that, that question first, then we go back to the other two? You're changing the rules, my friend. <laughs> I'm going to forget uh, the right. question. It's <laughs> hardly <laughs> 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 up to you, dude. <laughs> Come on, then. I'm sorry. No, that's all right. Um, I just really love that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know what's that. <laughs> um, you, you certainly don't think about... Uh, I certainly didn't think about my career in, in quite those terms. I didn't, didn't think, you know... Uh, I'm going to have two or three defining stories in my life, and then I'm going to kind of curl up and, uh, and go away. Uh, <laughs> I think that about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I certainly, um, when you get a story like this, uh, it is defining. You know it's going to be. It, I had a gut feeling that this was, this was something very big. Uh, it took some proving. Um, I have to say, for those of you who want to go into to journalism, there is nothing quite like having the front page splash story on a Sunday newspaper. It's the kind of journalistic equivalent of scoring a goal at Wembley. You know, this is, this is a big deal. Um, but with that comes a huge amount of responsibility. Uh, and again, it's difficult when people haven't seen the film. But I think, and I hope that, well, I feel that what Gavin has, has put across in the film via Matt Smith's performance is the huge um, uh, tension and uh, moral, well, tension and moral ambiguity of that position where you, you have the responsibility of a big story, the responsibility to your readers that it is absolutely nailed down and is the truth, and the responsibility to your, to your source, even if you don't know who that person is, uh, to make sure that they aren't damaged by what you do. Um, so, I mean, I hope that answers your question to a certain extent, but... Um, don't Tell us wrong. how happy you were when you found out that Catherine had been exposed. Come on, that's fine. <laughs> Just to get some Gavin levity in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Gavin, Gavin likes the idea I'm... of the... Of the um, <laughs> the serious ambiguity of the journalist's uh, lot. Yeah. Um, don't get me wrong, when we discovered this news that a 27-year-old Mandarin translator... Well, and it wasn't that, uh, as specific as that. It was at the time, yes. It, it wasn't. Did. Wasn't it? What did it I say? don't think so. <laughs> it just said somebody had been arrested. Okay. I when we decided, there's a little bit of fake news there kind of creeping in. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> if it had said that much, I wouldn't have been able to stay anonymous for That's so long, true. I think. Yeah. No, no, so, but he means, uh, at the risk no, no. of being the researcher, well, he means when your name... No, no, no. no, 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 no I'll just shut up. Yeah, no, I yeah, don't. Well. See the truth? <laughs> <laughs> See how this... <laughs> it's, all, it's, all, it's all unraveling before It's all right. unraveling before I um, Okay, so when no, you found out when that there really was a GCHQ source, not that it wasn't fake, yeah. I was hugely relieved and may even have punched the air. <laughs> Which is uh, not in the movie. Because <laughs> you, you never know. Um, you know, you are worried the whole time that maybe this is some sort of sophisticated forgery. It's just in the back of your mind there's that nagging doubt. And um, You did you, feel awful after you punched the air though, didn't you? Yeah, I say that. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I did. After I punched the air, it was like, oh, God, oh, yeah, mm, oh, awful. Poor person. Better get her a lawyer. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, the, the, and the power of this film is that there is an ambiguity about the roles of... It, this is not a simple goodies versus baddies story. 
and uh, yeah, it would be crazy for me to suggest that uh, that, that journalists were 100% uh, heroic. Well, um, going back to the question <laughs> you asked, um, when I made the leak, it was sort of a gut instinct. I didn't have any kind of I, I wasn't thinking about consequences um, to myself I could just see this impending war right it was looming ahead this this awful awful catastrophic series of events and I saw a memo that had the possibility I felt of intervening in that of, of derailing that process so that is why I le leaked it um, the question about um, safeguards, yeah. Well, safeguards, yeah. For whistleblowers. Um, well, I'm for national security. Good, really good question. So, yeah. how do you, how do you, as I understand what, it, how do you protect whistleblowers, but at the time make sure that you safeguard national security? Is that correct? Yeah. I think, you know. At the moment, it's an extremely, extremely rare thing. You know, n hardly anybody comes out. I mean, th the whole Britain is such a secretive society, and um, uh, absurdly so, mm. really. I mean, there's no need to the degrees of secrecy that we have in this in this country. I think. You know, if it, in the U.S. they have a slightly more balanced approach, although they're abusing it now with the Espionage Act. Mm. Um, but there are only a few categories that are of information that are protected in the U.S. In the U.K., it's a blanket cover, and, and that's really, as I say, it's absurd. Um, I think, on the whole, most intelligent, professional people who are working in these jobs are aware of what's in the national security. They're not going to leak information and jeopardize their career if they think it's going to damage national security. The reason people leak information or expose information on the whole is because they think something is seriously wrong, something that ne needs to be rectified. Um, and in fact, in the corporate world, in the US, for example, there are um, sort of uh, hotlines and where rewards, and financial rewards. incentives, yeah, in financial incentives, and you know, to leak, and, and and it doesn't just mean that you can leak anything and get paid a million dollars. No, I mean it means if you if they if they can prove that what you've exposed a actually happened, um, a and that it was damaging to the company, then yes, they'll they'll um, you know they'll reward you for bringing forth that information and saving that corporation, presumably. Uh, a lot of money from exposing that fraud. Well, the main thing is also it's really in tax law in the United States. So if you if you sh if you leak information that shows that the corporation that you're working for is not paying its taxes properly, for example, mm -hmm. you can get a financial incentive. So we encourage people to tell the truth when the government can collect more money. <laughs> we don't encourage people to tell the truth when the government might look like they're lying to the population. So to, to your question about um, national security versus leaking, I think, the, the, let's just stick to the Official Secrets Act as an act in this country. If there is no defense to the Official Secrets Act, in other words, if you leak any information and you've signed the Official Secrets Act and you're working at these places, you have no defense straight to jail. How is this good for the country? And I'll say why. A crime was being committed. Let's be clear. This is not, oh, it's nice to tap other people's phones. We're actually a nation of laws. I like that Catherine says that this doesn't happen all the time. We are actually bound by being signatories to the United Nations Charter. And that charter makes us bound by certain rules. And one of the rules is we do not tap the private communications of UN Security Council delegates. Now, do we support that law? Or you know what, it's a law, but if we go behind it, but God forbid Chile does it, or God forbid someone else does it, we'll bring you down. Well, we're bloody hypocrites. So a crime was being committed that, that this email was evidence of. And, and I'm sorry if I sound passionate about it, but either we believe in justice and democracy, or we don't. There's none of this muddy gray area, because as soon as we get muddy, mm. Where are the lines? The line is simple. You do not spy on UN Security Council delegates. And if you do, you should go to bloody jail. And I don't care if you're a security analyst or not. 
Otherwise, we don't live in a liberal democracy. We live in an authoritarian bullshit dictatorship behind the scenes. So this young lady exposed criminal activity and then was charged with a crime? Really? It's a crime to reveal criminal activity? Something is wrong in the state of Denmark, right? <laughs> so, to your question, national security is perfectly protected if we abide by certain rules. As her character says, I have no problem listening into information that might help prevent a terror attack. There are rules in our countries, United States and Britain, which allow you to tap people's phones. You need to go to a judge. There are actually rules for these things. If you have sufficient evidence that you believe that a crime may be, or a plot may be going on, you can get permission to tap the phones of individuals. And you can listen in. And you can bring that information and you can put them away. Now, either we have rules or we don't have rules. I'm really intolerant of this, well, it's a bit murky. No, it's not. And if it is, we need to fix the rule. So here's my question. Catherine didn't get her day in court. Since Margaret Thatcher threw out the idea of um, public interest defense in 1989 when she amended the act, post being caught in a lie about the Belgrano, sinking of the Belgrano ship, the Argentinian ship, Clive Ponting, who leaked that information, was able to defend himself by saying it is in the public interest to know when the government is lying. She amended the act. Public interest now, whatever the government says it is. That's not a liberal democracy, that's authoritarianism. So I think that public interest defense should be brought back. And what didn't happen with Catherine is, as you'll see in the film, her lawyers came up with another defense to the Official Secrets Act in this very unique set of circumstances. Um, when is it necessary to break the law? There's in law, as the lawyers will know, a defense called the defense of necessity. Usually applies when you're racing to the hospital with your pregnant wife or, and you've got to get there and you're breaking the speed limit and you get pulled over by the cop and he says, here's your ticket. And you go, yes, thank you very much for the ticket and you immediately speed off again. And you go to the hospital and your wife delivers the baby and you go back and the court says, you were speeding and you say, yes, I broke the law but it was necessary to break the law in order to save a life. That much higher purpose is a defense to the breaking of a law, like a speeding ticket, or a fireman bashing down your door and breaking your property to get to rescue a baby on the other side of it. So we have laws that say it is sometimes okay to break the law. That was a defense that her lawyers were going to present in court and her case was dropped. I'm giving away some of the film. I'm so <laughs> it's okay. The main because, part. The main the thing. But I think you'll, you'll, you'll love it when you get there because you'll have a bit of this thought in your mind. So th we haven't tested that defense. Was the case dropped because they didn't want that test d defense to prove successful and provide a crack for us to get through this cover-up that goes on in, under, under the name of national security? So to your question, I think it is perfectly possible to predict genuine... Um, security interests um, and at the same time have certain defenses that hold our national security institutions and governments accountable and we need to find that balance. I don't know if that answers your question but we need both. Well I think that's uh, certainly a good note to end on. Um, on behalf of all of us at the Union I certainly want to thank you all very much for making the trip over here. Thank, thank you. you. And if you'll all join me in a round of applause for our speakers. Thank you, thank you so much. Everybody. Thank you.